This is Rosa Brooks from uh, Georgetown University. Uh, she writes, if you were worried about whether it was okay for the U.S. government to secretly kill an American citizen overseas, you can relax. The Justice Department says killings are hunky-dory as long as some, quote, informed high-level official decides that citizens pose a, quote, eminent threat and capture would be, quote, unfeasible. Uh, you and I have talked about this before related to what Eric Holder said. Uh, in a speech that he gave, but this provides a much more detailed uh, legal rationale. What What is the argument presented in this document? Well, the first thing to note is that this document right at the outset says that it is not attempting to determine the necessary legal conditions for drone strikes targeting American citizens. Uh, so it's laying out guidelines, but it also acknowledges at the outset that perhaps this is uh, not necessary, that there might be other guidelines, weaker standards even, uh, although it's hard to imagine uh, what, what those could possibly be. Uh, the problem here is that it gives a, a document that gives the appearance of limitations on the president's power to target Americans for assassination, but then defines the terms that it uses in a way that makes those limits meaningless. So it says uh, you know, that uh, a citizen can be targeted if they pose an imminent threat, but then it qualifies that uh, to, to clarify that an imminent threat doesn't necessarily mean that there's any specific known attack that is uh, planned in, any, in the near future. So what does imminent mean there? Well. Nothing, as far as we can tell. Charlie Savage and Scott Shane say in the New York Times, it adopts an elastic definition of imminent, as you said, saying it is not necessary for a specific attack to be in process when a target is found if the target is generally engaged in terrorist activities aimed at the United States. Generally engaged seems like... The, the key here is that uh, when, when the document says someone who is generally engaged in terrorist activities, what it means is someone who's been accused by some high-level official in the intelligence community of being involved in those activities. Uh, certainly, we know that these strikes in the past have uh, not always necessarily killed dangerous terrorists. We know that the 16-year-old son of uh, Anwar al-Awlaki, the uh, uh, al-Qaeda-affiliated cleric, uh, was killed in a drone strike. And uh, it's hard to believe that he was a senior operational leader of any kind. Uh, so there's no requirement, of course, that any kind of external check, verify that someone is engaged in terrorist activities. This can be done without judicial approval and essentially in secret. We know about four American citizens who have been killed in drone strikes, um, but there's no requirement that they disclose this either before or after the fact. Uh, so there's no one, in effect, checking their work, uh, confirming that people targeted and killed really are guilty of what they're accused of. The president acknowledged that this kind of program existed at some point last year. Jay Carney, uh, in being asked about uh, this uh, program, said, these strikes are legal, they are ethical, and they are wise. The U.S. government takes great care in deciding uh, to pursue an al-Qaeda terrorist to ensure precision and to avoid loss of innocent life. Now, on the, the matter of innocent life, uh, remember the New York Times uh, last year detailed the fact that there's a great deal of loss of a great deal of loss of innocent life, but also that there is a presumption of terrorist activity with the people that they are targeted. Well, so it's very easy to convince yourself that you're taking great care to avoid the loss of innocent life if you don't do very much to check after the fact whether you've killed innocent people. So, uh, on, certainly with strikes not involving American citizens, we know that if a bunch of essentially uh, 18 to 25-year-old uh, Arab males are killed, uh, they're presumed to have been militants. No one is going after the fact to see whether, uh, you know, these are actually people who were involved in something, uh, you know, violent activity. When we talked about this last time, uh, you noted that Eric Holder had a very expansive definition or, or a narrow definition, depending on how you're looking at it, of what constitutes due process in this whole mm -hmm. thing. The judicial branch, for whatever their role might be, seems to be pushed to the side here. Sure. And, and judges have really so far been willing to step aside to say that it's not appropriate for them to review this. Uh, but, you know, we do have a standard for uh, the conditions under which an American citizen who is guilty of treason uh, can be punished and indeed executed for it uh, requires 
things like uh, the statement of two people in open court, uh, not a decision by a high-level uh, intelligence official who is then neither required to, uh, you know, inform either the target or anyone else of that decision or present evidence for it publicly. Um, one of the disturbing things about this is that, I mean, this is a, a white paper summarizing a much longer and more detailed uh, legal analysis from the Office of Legal Counsel. Congress had that a year ago. The ACLU has been trying through Freedom of Information suits to get that out. This is obviously a document that had no sensitive classified national security information that imperils the safety of the United States. Uh, it's not clear why this couldn't have been released a year ago. It's not clear why at least a redacted version of the full legal analysis of this uh, can't be released to the public. So, you know, we're doing this not only with the actual decision of who to kill and why being made in secret, but even the abstract legal justification, the basis for the administration's claims that this is a legal program being kept secret. And that seems uh, fairly fundamentally uh, contrary to the principles of, uh, of a, a liberal democracy. A lot of people have compared this to the Bush torture memos. Right. I mean, this is, this is certainly another case of the administration uh, taking upon itself the power to give the executive authority to authorize uh, things that we have traditionally been uncomfortable with in this country and uh, keeping secret not only again, the details of their decisions, but the legal justification for them. And certainly even in the fuzziness about the definition of imminence, there is uh, a clear echo of President Bush's justification of effectively preemptive war, that we are uh, entitled to attack in self-defense, not just when we know that an adversary is about to attack us, but when we think they may at some future point attack us.